from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the pleasure of having uh, Mansur Florohi, uh, neurosurgeon from London and Brighton, I believe. Uh, he's going to make uh, the presentation on management of college cysts and surgical tips. And let me just go around quickly and introduce people from the panel. Good day, Rafi. Hi, John. So my name is Rafi Damakud, neurosurgeon in Brighton and London, and I work closely with Mansur and as we've been mentioning, hopefully we can run something regular, um, educational, and yeah, I'm looking forward myself to hearing this talk today from Monsor on colloid cysts and all the different approaches. Okay, very good. Kay Hamid, Kay Hamid, are you there, Kay? This sometimes is a little clumsy if people don't, okay, it's, let me see, is anyone else available to be introduced? And Andros Bukas. I'm not very successful with this usually. Okay, let's just turn it over to uh, Mansur. Welcome, and uh, it's all yours. Okay, um, good evening, everybody. I'm Mansur for one of the neurosurgeons from southeast of England, and it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to um, discuss with you and do a presentation about colloid cysts. I've, we could talk about this subject for hours and hours, literally, and show you dozens of videos, but, um, well, actually not dozens, what, one and a half dozen. Um, but I just picked some relevant points to share with trainees and also colleagues. And I'd be honored to answer any questions and share experiences with you. Um, and hopefully during the discussion, we can touch on some important points and share some tips uh, regarding management and, and, um, and some surgical tips, particularly for endoscopy. Um, so um, let's see if we can share this screen uh here we go okay can you see the screen yeah you, you, there you go fantastic per, per, perfect perfect so um i put it as to operate or not to operate that's the question um it's a bit shakespearean but really that's the one of the important questions to answer with this whole subject so what are colloid cysts we know that um that ectopic endodermal um uh, um, um, migration in the velum, interpositum, supposedly embryologically, and this occurs during development and, and embryological development. Importantly, they say the incidence is 3.2 colloid cysts per million. By incidence, we mean number of new cases per year in a population. Um, we think, actually, that the incidence is obviously much higher than this because of uh, a very important scenario, which, which I'll touch upon, um, which is incidentally. Uh, incidentally detected colloid cysts because of so many scans being done in the population. And we'll come back to this. Um, the origin of this is supposed to be in the rostral aspect of the third ventricular roof, and they're supposed to project inferiorly, but obviously that's not going to be the case all the time, which I'll also discuss. Um, and they're attached to the wall of the third ventricle by stem um, that provides a partial stability uh, in the lumen ventricle. Um, they count allegedly between 0.52% of intracranial tumors. I really am suspect, uh, suspicious of this type of figures which are branded around in books and papers because, once again, because they're much more increasingly diagnosed now uh, due to incidental diagnosis. So this figure would be very different now. Uh, and uh, they're the most, but it's pretty certain they're the most common third ventricular mass seen in the adult population. Uh, the symptoms include headaches, which may be constant, intermittent, migraines, and even positional has been described. And I have seen that, and I believe that is that can be the case. Uh, other symptoms include nausea, vomiting, disturbmentation, memory problems, even seizures and drop attacks have been described and, and, and seen um, frequently, um, and even leg weakness. Now, important feature is that um, um, what they look like on CT scan uh, they're supposedly most of the time round, although they can be oval. They're supposedly hyperdense masses in the anterior third ventricle of the foramen membrana. We're going to see that they're not always hyperdense. Um, on MR and T2, T1 weighted, they're homogeneously hyperintensive, not all the time, as we're going to find out. And on T2, classically, uh, the central portion of the cyst can be hyperintense. Uh, rim enhancement is very seldom. Um, this is one that you see on a CT scan, see with a dark center and bright all around. This is another one on a CT scan with a hyper density uh, and, a, and a substantially large one. 
Here's one on a T2 weighted MR. See, it's very uh, hyper intense. And here's another one on MR, uh, which looks on T1 very different. Here's another one on CT, but hydrocephalus and very hyper intense. Here's another one, which is hypo intense uh, on CT with hydrocephalus. So they can look variable, but the classic features are what, I, what we've described here. Now, um, this is a bit more information for those interested from a particular paper describing its characteristic features. Uh, in 68 incidentally discovered colloid cysts varying in size between 1 to 5 and 32%, 5 to 10 and 54%, 10 mils in millimeter diameter and about 13%. And um, these papers that describe these, interestingly, you know, you go to big countries and big units, um, you're going to find different descriptions. And in smaller setups and smaller countries, you're going to have again different sizes and it really depends what population you look at in terms of presentation in the modern western world if you like or technologically advanced world you're going to find a lot more incidentally discovered ones and of course other parts of the world you're going to find a lot more symptomatic ones that have a scan because of a need and therefore they're inevitably going to be larger and these are the characteristics uh, which are described as the various proportions which i've put there for you i'm happy to share this with others later Surgical options include transcalosal approach, which we're going to talk about a bit, and an excision. There's transcortical approach and excision, which we're going to talk about as well. Endoscopic fenestration excision, which I'm going to talk mainly about and share some tips with you. Stereotactic aspiration was one that was described in textbooks before, uh, hardly ever done, but I'm going to discuss and show you a video how to aspirate endoscopically and, and even not excise it if you don't have to, particularly in the population, if it's uh, aspiratable. Uh, and there are some tricks with that which you can use with suction and, of course, with the new advanced CUSA systems, which are available now. Um, and, of course, there's just a simple insertion of a shunt, which we're going to discuss briefly. So, this is one with hydrocephalus. Pretty easy to discuss, to decide what to do here. Um, Rafi, can you hear me at all? Yeah, I'm listening. Um, I mean, we're going to have some case presentations at the end, some, some case series that'd be important to, nice to interact with, with those who are logging on to see what questions they have and what options. But you know, this is a case where you see this presenting acutely and um, um, certain options will apply. But I think everyone would, would agree that if you're going to deal with this surgically, um, a treatment of the hydrocephalus is key, but all options can apply here. Transventricular route, endoscopic route particularly at the beginning. You can even do uh, transcalosal as long as you deal with hydrocephalus acutely on the way in. Um, and um, e even shunt procedure can apply. But this is one of those nice diagnoses and conditions where it is relatively rare to get an acute case. And your options should be, should be chosen. Your options should be chosen from the repertoire depending on your skill set and how you're training and what's available to you and what you're comfortable in doing, uh, not just, you know, uh, because it's there. Um, important to mention that there are two other ways that colloid cysts are supposed to be, uh, supposed to be present. One is incidentally, following a CT scan MRI for other reasons, and during even post-mortem for deaths uh, unrelated. And then, of course, there's a sudden death scenario, which everyone's terrified about, which we're going to touch on importantly, and uh, this may be due to the acute blockage of CSF or allegedly due to disturbance of the hypothalamic mediated cardiovascular reflex, um, which these are all theories, um, but we're going to talk a bit more about that. Talking a bit about incidentally, there is a condition which people know about called VOMIT, and it stands for Victim of Modern Imaging Technology, Victim of Modern Imaging Technology. This was described first in a beautiful essay, one of many wonderful essays that Richard Haywood wrote, who was the previous lead neurosurgeon in Great Ormond Street. And he described this for initially two sets of parents who'd waited a long time, sadly, um, with anxiety to see him, to only be fully reassured regarding purely incidental findings on their children's scans. And while they were waiting, sadly, as patients often do and parents often do, um, uh, they were anxious and he described them as victims of modern imaging technology and we of course see um, thousands of such patients uh, every week in the in the health system um, who have a scan and, and, and are anxious left knowing what it is and then they wait to see an expert and colloid cyst um, 
are now becoming one of those, just like patients with pineal cysts and arachnoid cysts and Chiari one malformations and cavernous hemangiomas and aneurysms, which are not ruptured, and AVNs and so on and so forth. These are all incidental findings uh, very often, most often. The sudden death scenario is different, and we'll talk a bit more about that. So here's a colloid cyst on a CT scan with hyperintensity in its center. Um, and this is instantly discovered, obviously. And the story here, anyone recognize this gentleman? Rafid? I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Uh, it, oh, you do. I know you do because this is Harvey Cushing. Oh, really? Um, okay, that's a young Harvey Cushing. He lost yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> His is a younger photo. Um, and why I put him there? Because he, he had asked for a postmortem on his brain when he passed away. And he had one. Um, the, the, the legend of neurosurgery and certainly the giant of neurosurgery in the early part of the last century, who did so much for neurosurgery. He had a colloid cyst. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So the dreaded sudden death scenario. We're going to talk a bit about this. This is very important for the trainees and, and, and for others, and also for those interested in the medical legal aspect of this condition. I've done a uh, been involved in a medical legal report for this for this sort of case. Well, I just say one of the people listening did know that Ad Adnan Carson did, did recognize and did know that he was on he had a colitis as well. So good on him for that. Wonderful, him. excellent. We should we should have um, a a a, a, a you, in or vote in um, uh, questions and answers. Wonderful, well done. So the sudden death reports, in, um, uh, the first report was, I think, in 1957. I, I was going to write an article about this. I did a bit of research into it, and then as I just, we're so busy in the NHS and other things, we, I decided not to. But the incidence is actually much higher um, from what I found out myself following reading of other articles. And um, there's a good one by Butner et al. in 1997. who reviewed the literature and found 98 cases of literature at that time. And for sure, the numbers would be well above 100 now, probably with most of even bother reporting it. Now, in all of these cases, and anything that I've found since then, um, important to note that the cysts have never been bigger than 0.8 centimeters in diameter, if you want to draw a rough guidance. I mean, it's difficult to describe a cyst when, it, well, let's say, it's oval as opposed to spherical. Uh, so it's a good, important landmark to, to have. So, for example, if you're finding a cyst incidentally of six millimeters, you can pretty much reassure the patient that you're not going to have a sudden deterioration. And we'll talk a bit more about sudden deterioration. So it's a good, important uh, dimension to remember. Um, the vast majority of the cases that have passed away with acute deterioration in colloid cysts, and I'm happy to discuss this with anyone if they can provide evidence otherwise, have occurred in the early hours, in the early mornings. And um, also, this whole scenario of sudden acute death, drop dead and all that, and, and sudden death, just simply does not happen. What happens is patients rapidly deteriorate by the history of headaches. So at least a few hours of severe headaches and deterioration. It usually, typically, they will have a have history of headaches for months, if not at least weeks, on and off, periodically. And for several days, they would have been unwell. Um, no one has just suddenly dropped dead, God forbid. I hope I'm making that point clear. It just so doesn't happen. You're saying that the mechanism is, it sounds like acute hydrocephalus rather than what's reported in some books about what you just mentioned as well for the mechanism of sudden death. Uh, indeed. Um, there is, there is a theory regarding the sudden death, but when you look in detail of the cases that have been published and anything that I've ever seen or other colleagues have seen, and you know, in your memory, I'm sure you would have remembered one or two cases, uh, sadly, uh, who have not survived. And I've certainly remembered a, a, a maybe less than a handful, and certainly I remember three of them. They, they have been a, a major history and when you dive into it, and, and it's never just sudden short attack. I'm sorry, that's just a, a misnomer. It doesn't happen. It's a bit like the sudden deterioration with a Chiari, Chiari one. It, it, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and although much more likely with a colloid cyst, the history is several hours. Typically, the patients have had severe headaches for hours, if not days, uh, quite often for weeks, uh, on and off. And it's just got gradually worse and worse. Then they've been exhausted, gone to bed, and then sadly not woken up, uh, and etc. And um, I can share with you several other stories of acute attacks, which, which I've seen over the years. Um, 
I haven't done many of them, but just over, I think 24 is the account of my case series and 11, the last 11 have all been done endoscopically and I haven't done one for, done, haven't done one for some time now. Uh, so they're, they're quite rare to present, but if you're gonna do them electively for those, then it's a different matter. Some people are starting to do that and some have been doing it for years, which I'll discuss. Now, some other features, um, this is from the paper by, I'm sorry, my, my point is not working, but by Beaumont uh, from 2016. Uh, but all these papers I've quoted there uh, are saying the same thing which I've quoted in, in these last two slides about the sizes, dimensions, sudden tax and all that. So the quite a striking feature was that in the Beaumont paper, the most striking feature was a 14, 14 fold difference between the largest volume cyst seen with a so, without associated hydrocephalus and the smallest volume lesion that did result in obstructive hydrocephalus. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there is a, a huge difference between, uh, there, has, there was a notable huge difference between one size, maximum size, that didn't cause any symptoms and a small one that did. And then if you analyze that further, it appears that the small volume cysts that cause hydrocephalus commonly project caudally, not cranially, caudally, downwards through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. And in contrast, cysts with comparatively large volumes in any series that don't cause any problems are the ones that typically go upwards from the foramen of Monroe into the lateral ventricle. And here's a picture of that kind of scenario, the top one and the bottom one. I hope that's sort of clear. Now, it's not rocket science. It's not sort of a gem of information, but it's something useful to remember that it's not just about size. It's about location and projection and where the anatomy is in terms of the blockage and potential for problems. And in the same paper, they, they proposed a scoring system, taking the age of the patient to account, headaches or not, and symptoms, diameter, whether it's above seven millimeters or not, and flare sequence, and whether something is soft or not, uh, or gelatinous or not, and et cetera. And I think a very good one to remember is that after the age of 65, um, particularly after 70, they virtually never cause acute problems. I have yet to see one or hear of one. Um, and uh, so, but beware of the young patient with a colloid cyst. Um, anyway. So uh, what you're saying also is, or what the literature is saying is, if there is a colloid cyst of under eight millimeters, regardless of location, it should not be able to occlude uh, the foramen of Monroe bilaterally and, and cause acute hydrocephalus. Is that, is that the...? Correct. It's not, it, it would be the first to cause acute crisis. So if you decide to manage that patient electively and just surveillance and say, I'm going to monitor you, that's perfectly reasonable. But if you're going to do that with a 10 millimeter colloid cyst or 11 or 12 millimeters, you know, which you can still do, of course, then you've got less safety. But it's something very useful to remember and reassure patients with. And these don't suddenly grow to a large size, which we're going to discuss in a minute anyway. Acute deterioration. Uh, this is in a paper by David Hammer from 2000. Acute deterioration in symptomatic cases. So in a case series of 78 patients, which they monitored, 32 patients had 32 percent had acute deterioration and nine um, and, and, and nine with deaths, sadly, of 12 percent. Um, and so the breakdown of it was that um, the overall mortality in this series, which was published in 1997, was 12%. But what was interesting, which they highlighted, is that the national incidence of colloid cysts in the Netherlands was supposed to be about one per one million person uh, per uh, years. But the prevalence, okay, which means how many cases are then the population as a snapshot at any time, was supposed to be around 1,800 asymptomatic colloid cysts. I'm not going to go into how they calculated that out. So the prevalence, which means the number of cases at in the population at any one time, is far more than the incidence, which means the new cases presenting per year. Um, so one in 8,500, I think, is very reasonable. You know yourself, Rafid, how many which we see from time to time incidentally discovered on MRI and CT scan. Yeah. So this whole thing about the you know, 1% to 2% of all intracranial tumors doesn't really help, I don't think, because it depends what you mean by tumor and you mean prevalence or incidence. But it's a good figure to, I think, to remember that around one in 10,000 people um, uh, have a colloid cyst. And, and I think that figure could be even more common. Just like pineal cysts are now far more common depending on how you classify what a pineal cyst is and how, how well you look for it, whether it's post-mortem or an MRI 
or a four millimeter cyst or a six millimeter cyst, or whatever you can detect. So here's another picture of one. Um, an important point from this paper from 97 was that they made a very useful point that if you've got younger patients, beware. So someone, let's say in their 20s, they're far more likely to become symptomatic during their lifetime. And then offering an expected surgical resection is quite reasonable. And they proposed it was a preferred management strategy. So we have colleagues, particularly internationally in the United States and elsewhere, and I certainly, you know, uh, you know, Johan was the same and very justified. If your results are very good and you can offer elective excision of a small colloid cyst in a young person, which has not yet even caused obstructive hydrocephalus, it's very reasonable as long as your results justify it. So your, if your complication rate is low uh, and the patient's accepting, then you can certainly make that case. Um, this is from a, a, another very useful publication where they monitored uh, uh, 25 identical 162 patients with colloid cysts. This is from uh, uh, Pollock, 1999, uh, and you've got the breakdown of the years and the sizes and etc. Um, but what is interesting is the next slide: the natural history of asymptomatic colloid cyst. The review at two, five, and ten years. Um, was done in 40, 28, and 14 patients respectively. But the incidence of symptomatic progression was zero, zero, and then 8% at two, five, and 10 years respectively. So for me, it's a very useful figure to remember that if patients ask, you can say, well, look, as far as progression, symptomatic progression, when you follow up for 10 years, about 8% can progress to become symptomatic in asymptomatic cases. And in their review, no patients died suddenly during follow-up interval. I have never experienced that during anyone that I've followed up or anyone that any colleague has followed up that I've known. And it'd be very interesting to have, um, uh, you know, one day a paper reviewing large series of acute deteriorations to see how they, uh, you know, what, what, what happened to these patients, particularly in, um, in, from a recent um, series. That would be very interesting and pooling results together, maybe nationally. Um, I'm going to jump in because there's so much to discuss and I'm not sure how much time I've got, but um, I'll, I'll skip over this slide. Important, therefore, this conclusion is that conservative management for small colloid cysts that are asymptomatic without any symptoms, therefore, is justified and appropriate. Very, very reasonable. But excision of small asymptomatic colloid cysts may also be justified if there is good surgical expertise, young patient, in accordance with patient's wishes. And importantly, you've got to know your own results and not just the literature. So if you've got to, if you're going to operate, then you have to say to the patient, this is what I can offer, or this is what my unit can offer, and so on and so forth, and this is what the results uh, are like, and, and, and let them decide. Um, and I think that's very important, um, to know your own results and, and let the patient decide with appropriate consent. It, since you had made a comment, um, and I was hoping he would be able to join, I just wanted to put this paper down in, in honor, really. Your I'm sure is more than 200 now. Um, but this was a, a paper which was published um, in 2008 um, with an experience of 134 cases, which is quite astonishing. Um, and I'm going to pay tribute to someone else as well, which is Graham Flint and also another colleague uh, much younger, about, um, my, my days, Peter Gann. Um, they both really taught me endoscopic colitis surgery when I was in Birmingham. And uh, Graham had done, I think, well over 70 which is an astonishing number, um, and virtually all endoscopic, um, uh, or maybe, the, sorry, maybe I think the majority endoscopic, and, um, and, and uh, Peter and myself, we, with, with much smaller numbers on my side, um, but much more from Peter, I think the number had gone to over 100, but it was never written up, sadly. Um, and this is a series of 134, which is astonishingly high as well, very high. And in summary, this was a single surgeon expertise, 134 consecutive cases in Helsinki and Kopio, where you had previously worked, all treated by interhemispheric far lateral approach. Um, and this with a breakdown of sizes and the years, and etc. And importantly, 50% of the patients presented with hydrocephalus. And the results showed no mortality, and this was the complications. And really, it showed that in, in his hands, the results of surgery were excellent. So you could justify surgery for smaller sizes, particularly, uh, and in younger patients. And um, 
and and it, it is very reasonable also to argue that you get very familiar with one approach if you really want to be good at something so what i've noticed is you know if people are endoscopically doing it then they just tend to do it endoscopically if they're very familiar with ventricular then they do transventricular but we, we'll discuss the nuances and benefits of each um in the interhemispheric foreign lateral transcorrosive approach I agree totally with this. It's, it's straightforward and experienced hands and the accuracy of the surgical trajectory is, speaks for itself. And this is a slide from, um, from your home from some time ago, um, how the incision was made, how the positioning was done. Uh, there was no neural navigation. It was a kind of rehearsed trajectory. Um, uh, and um, uh, you make a, a, a coronal incision, make a craniotomy, which is just past the sagittal sinus from the right side over to the left. Um, you can use two or three barrels, whatever you like, uh, and then um, reflect the dura medially uh, and um, the transcosal steps will, will, will go into in, in a little while. But very important, save the bridging veins. Now this is an important point for the trainees and I remember um, that um, Robert Spetzler asked this question in a very important PhD viva when he was visiting uh, Helsinki uh, uh, of somebody and uh, it was during um, uh, pericolosal artery aneurysm surgery and he said you know if you see a bridging vein do you take it or do you extend your craniotomy and he said I would I wouldn't hesitate to extend the craniotomy and he said absolutely right and I think that's a very uh, important thing to remember you know removing a bit more bone which you can put back for access is very trivial compared to taking a bridging vein which is draining partial part of the brain so if you can avoid taking it do avoid taking it um, and i think that's an important point a corpus callosum is identified by the overlying pedicles and arteries and this is a very important point and it's white color with the stride formations um, i've actually seen a surgeon quite experienced many years ago getting a bit lost in one of these surgeries because he mistook the cingulate gyrus and the proximity of the gyra, which were very adherent by bands, to the corpus callosum. Now, if you're just starting out with this approach, and or even if you're experienced, but of course we don't do it that often, I think don't hesitate to use neuro navigation um, because it will help you to get straight down your trajectory and even guide you in terms of your depth. But I think it's pretty hard to, to mistake the cingulate gyrus now for the corpus callosum. As I said, it's clearly white, the corpus callosum. You see the pericles of uh, arteries over it and it's unmistakable. If you see the closer marginal artery coming through the tissue one side, that's typically the cingulate gyri very close together. Um, anyway, the incision is about, you know, you don't need more than a centimeter, maximum two, but really you need one centimeter in the body, corpus callosum, just retract laterally uh, and as far laterally as possible and as reasonable. And you land into the ventricle. And this is the kind of um, a view that you can see in the on the corpus callosum as you um, put gentle gentle retraction um, uh, on the in the in the interhemispheric fissure. Another tip uh, for the trainees is this: that if when you're starting this out, this operation, one of the useful tips to do is to give a bit of mannitol, a short dose, 15 to 15 to 20 percent mannitol. I've seen that done by one surgeon over the years many times for virtually everything. And it just makes life a lot, lot easier. Um, you know, you don't have to give, you know, 200 mils of mannitol, just a short dose. You get a little retraction in the brain. It all helps. Uh, and the other is you don't need fixed retraction system in this surgery. You really don't. Uh, if you do your dissection and use your sucker and bipolar system as kind of gentle handheld retraction, at, when you're down to the corpus callosum, you can leave, uh, and people do different things, and you can see videos of this on the internet as well, and nuances in textbooks. You can use cotton balls, uh, small ones at top and bottom, anterior and posterior, to kind of keep the retraction. You can use uh, um, uh, patties uh, uh, and so on. And after a while, it just stays apart, uh, and you, you don't need a huge gap. But you don't need a fixed retraction system for this. That's not to say you don't, you shouldn't use it. If you want to use it, as long as you're not really retracting the brain, you're holding it away. I think that's fine too. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a small hole down the microscope and, and um, quite a lovely approach to use. Very important, save the ventricular veins. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that. They're, they're, well, I'll tell you a tip now. Um, in the third ventricular surgery, and it was um, um, during a session with um, Ugor Ture, 
who, who mentioned this uh, point. If you third ventricular surgery is rare, let's face it, no one does lots of it. But if you're going to go into the third ventricle in microsurgical dissection, then you typically got down to the see the frame in Monroe and put the choroid plexus to one side immediately and uh, go into in the in the, in the fissure. And obviously, you don't go through the frame of Monroe, you go from the posterior aspect of it. But one of the things that will help is knowing which side has got a dominant vein. And if you do a CTA, you will see typically, as he described, that one foramen mundro has got a bigger thalamostriate vein going through it than the other. And that's the, and use the smaller one for such access. And it's something nice to look, to look at on MR or imaging, whatever you've got to, before any such surgery of the, for colloid cysts to see what's the veins like and they're under the foramen mundro ventricular system. Uh, and uh, it will give you some preparation. There are some tips, for, particularly with endoscopic resection. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. So this is just some useful slides I've got on the internet to kind of describe things, but um, uh, it, it's more or less what I've said. But the bottom picture, if you, when you go down the interhemispheric fissure, you've separated the, callosum, uh, the, uh, the singular gyri from each other, you're down onto the corpus callosum, you, make an, you go between the uh, pericolosal arteries um, and be aware that sometimes there might be a connection between both of them. So you pick a spot, one centimeter incision through the uh, corpus callosum, and you then take care to orientate yourself to go one side or the other. If you go in the midline, you could end up into, uh, within, the, um, within the septum, uh, within the uh, cavum. And then you know, you'd be right between the, the fornices, the low region. So it's, remember to go one side or the other. And right, of course, you want to go through the right side, it's virtually always. Um, and if you go to the right side, you see the right sided picture of the ventricle. Um, so you know on the right ventricle because you see the choroid fissure, you see the thalamostriate vein, and you see the septal vein going towards the septum me, uh, on the right hand side medially, and you see the caudate vein uh, anteriorly, and so on. And you know you're in the right lateral ventricle looking at the Munro. And this is some more pictures to kind of illustrate what you see. And this is where we mean you do not damage the veins in the ventricle, because then you will get some kind of infarction, sadly. So it's mandatory, really crucial, not to damage the veins. And here's another picture just to illustrate the point on the same side. I'm sorry, my pointer doesn't seem to be working. But what, what we've highlighted is that the fornix uh, is going around on the anterior and superior margin aspect of the frame of Monroe. That you don't want to damage, and absolutely never in uh, both sides in any kind of surgery, but even one side, just you don't want to damage that uh, because it will affect the memory function. Thank you for highlighting that, Rafid. Um, I think that's you anyway. <laughs> it wasn't me. I think, that, I think that we've got some AI going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Just <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure people can interact, but I'm going to describe the rest of the stuff with some cases, and then I've got you know some videos to share with you if you if you like. Um, if are there any questions at the moment? Oh, okay. Well, again, it's Adnan. Um, Adnan is honest. <laughs> he yeah. did the arrow. Yeah. I don't know how they clear. It was a lot more okay. about it than we do. But um, no, there's no um, <laughs> questions yet. Uh, but uh, although I'm interjecting outside of the topic, Monsoor, I have mentioned to the guys is we're forming a WhatsApp group so that we can update regularly about the teaching session. So as John forms the posters, yeah. then we can shoot out a flyer to people. Sure. Uh, regular days at 7 p.m. No, that's excellent. Um, so Rafi, I just want to ask everybody, you know, here, this is a patient who's presented acutely. Let's say the GCS is low, they become drowsy, they were sitting around in A&E, uh, with headaches and then they've deteriorated and um, this is their scan of the intubation ventilation. Okay, so let's just say GCS was uh, eight before intubation ventilation, pupils equal and reactive still, and this is your CT scan. And you see a colloid cyst causing acute hydrocephalus. What are the options here? So, okay, we're asking everybody who's logged yeah, in. Yeah, if, if anyone wants to make any comment, what, what, what operation you would perform? What are the options? And well, I think questions you may want first of all before you 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 know you so we, we've got Dr. Nitin saying that you'd go for an EVD. Yeah, so that's a very good point. I think you go by what's available. Not every neurosurgeon is a colloid cyst neurosurgeon. You're on call. Maybe you might be a mainly spine neurosurgeon, do a bit of cranial, and 
I think if you put an EVD, that's very reasonable. So we have a few colleagues suggesting EVD, bilateral EVDs. And, yeah, and yeah, I think that's an important point which we're just coming on to. So it's not beware. This is very important pearl. And I dealt with a medical legal case with this, sadly, uh, from elsewhere. If you put an EVD one side, the other ventricle may not be dealt with and deflated. So beware of that. So if you put an EVD, that's fine. Then take the patient for a repeat scan to make sure that the ventricle has been deflated as well, if that's all you're going to do in the acute stage. And that's perfectly reasonable. But make sure you deflate both lateral ventricles. It's likely you will get both lateral ventricles deflated on the EVD, but you may not. And this is a rare scenario, but it can happen. Another option is you just go to acute surgery. Um, although I've known one case in A&E to uh, for a needle to be put in through superorbital region into the ventricular space to save a life acutely because they were going to be delayed in going to theater, but that's another matter. If you're going to do an EVD, you can do one even with a Qajar uh, guided EVD as an emergency. Uh, as I said, handheld thing, disposable set, you could do that in theater, absolutely fine. But we were to do both sides uh, if you need to follow the repeat CT scan. Another option is to do an acute surgery, major surgery. You can um, um, do transventricular excision urgently. You know, just go straight to theater and do that. You can do an endoscopic acute excision to deal with that urgently. And, and I think that's very reasonable. But an important step is when you put your endoscope in, uh, what must you do in the right at the beginning, which I think is a very good tip for everybody. Um, well, that is to perform a septostomy, or at least ensure that the ventricles are communicating. Now, if it's acute hydrocephalus in a young person, there may not be any gaps in the septum. It might be closed off. So you do a septostomy straight away is the first thing you do before you get any, any other thing done, because you might get bleeding, you might not have done the septostomy, it might have to come out, which is highly unlikely. So the first thing you do is do a septostomy. It's very easy. You just pop your bipolar probe through the endoscope, and just as if like you're drawing with a pencil, just go a nice part of the septum where there's no blood vessels and just make a cut. And you can just make a window using your bipolar. And uh, Alexandro's got that right. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well done, Alexandro, well done. Um, then you can uh, you know, continue to the endoscopic excision. And let's just say your excision is not successful, which I think should be, uh, or at least a, 90% excision, if not, you leave a bit of capsule, but you should be able to get rid of the, uh, the college system vast majority of the time endoscopically. Uh, then you can just treat the patient later on with an EVD for a while and then convert to a shunt because you've done a septostomy. If there was any doubt, at least both ventricles are communicating. Or you can just leave an EVD on one side, but knowing that, both, that they're both sides are communicating. That's why septostomy is useful. Another thing you can do, do a transcalosal approach, but I think it would be a bit lunacy if you're doing transcalosis in the acute setting and you haven't treated it with the EVD to begin with. I think that's asking too much of the brain. So I would say that the ventricle needs draining first in an acute setting where someone's got raised ICP and you're trying to get into the, to the ventricle and you're retracting brain and so on. That's my view. I'm not rock solid about it. Maybe someone might disagree, but I think that's important. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are some of the options. Um, and in this case, I think dealt with endoscopically acutely. Um, you've got another one. This gentleman, he's 58, chronic headaches, gradual drop in mentation and drop attacks. And he's come in and he's alert and awake after these uh, episodic uh, periods. This is an interesting scan. And uh, this uh, I did jointly with another surgeon endoscopically. Um, and what's interesting is, is the size of this. Um, and it was the same approach, you know, go in, do a septostomy, then uh, I'll go through the steps with the video. But you basically put your endoscope in and initially, I think it's nice to coagulate the choroid plexus in that region a little bit. Just like you do choroid plexus coagulation for pediatric surgeons, you do choroid plexus coagulation for hydrocephalus and, and children who are used to that, who have done some before. You put your bipolar and it just kind of, you know, scorched earth policy with the choroid plexus. Uh, next to the thalamostride vein, careful not to touch any veins and etc. And that helps to minimize uh, bleeding as the endoscope instead of touching that area. Um, uh, and you obviously have to negotiate and be careful about it, especially depending on the size of the thalamostride vein on that side. Then you can aspirate or perforate the cyst. And I'll show you a technique on video how to, to do that. 
And of course, you've got a very good uh, piece of kit now, which is rarely used because there are not many cases, which is a very small mini kuza, which you can use to aspirate this fluid. And I have yet to use it, although I've known colleagues to use it and we have, have, good, uh, have success with it. I've previously just used the suction. And when you see a cyst like this, it's very suckable. It is suckable. And so, so on, on that note, well, there was a question about how do you, I know you touched on it a bit, but how do you assess the consistency of, of the colloid cyst and what do you depend on mostly, CT or MRI? It, yes, MRI. If you see a cyst like this, it's almost certainly going to be gelatinous and, and very soft. And the consistency is going to be soft. Um, and uh, because of the, just the way it looks on T1 and T2. Uh, which we've already described, because the vast majority are soft. Uh, if you see calcification on CT scan, it's a different matter, but those are going to be usually quite old patients and chronic and all that. Uh, and, but in the acute presentation, uh, relatively acute in this case, um, this was soft and, and quite clearly the case when you put the endoscope in. And the benefit of endoscopic is that what you can do is put the endoscope in, but prepare to do a transventricular if, it, if, if you're not doing well. And I've had to simply convert one endoscopic case to transventricular. Um, and that's fine. You've lost nothing. You've put a very small incision into the cortex. All you do is just minor extension to be able to get your uh, um, retractor system or brain holding retractors in and then excise it uh, by microsurgery. And that's fine. That's one of the benefits of, of endoscopic, that you can do that if, if, if all else is failing. And you probably have to do that maybe ten, you know, one in 10. And when we aspirate it, when we make an incision in this, gelatinous stuff comes out and you just put your suction on the endoscope, whichever endoscope that you've got. And if you've got a good assistant, you just switch backwards and forwards to heavy irrigation, heavy suction uh, for just you know, seconds at a time, two, three seconds at a time. And it, it will suck up quite nicely in the endoscope. And but what you don't want is the gelatinous stuff just to come out into the, into the ventricle. I think that's not good. Uh, and the instinct is to, is to evacuate like that and it works very well. Once you've got the scope, the, the cyst, in a um, uh, de deflated quite nicely, and I know people will, will cringe at this, but the, when I learned endoscopic technique, I was used to, you know, with, with you and other people I trained with, to do microsurgery, dissect it, you know, make sure you've got clear view of the attachment and make sure there's no arterial, su arterial supply to it, it's coagulated and the vein and all that. It just doesn't happen. If you just grab it gently and tease it and pull it and rotate it, it will just pull out. And when you get heavy, when you get bleeding, all you do is irrigate and just irrigate with Hartman's. Hartman's solution is better than saline. Use that as another golden tip, please. Don't use saline. When I used to use saline for anything uh, um, intraventricular, endoscopic, or and etc., and this is something that um, James Goodridge, uh, the late James Goodridge, also taught me. And, uh, and others, and he, he, he apparently said to me that, um, he said to me that Cushing, I don't think favored normal cell lines. So Hartman's is much more physiological for the CSF. And before when he used to use heavy irrigation, patients would get a response of um, tachycardia and hypertension. And the initiative would say the blood pressure is going up and they're tachycardic. And when I switched to Hartman's, anything intraventricular, even with a, you know, ETV and doing something else, and you've got a bit of bleeding um, with a biopsy, um, I switched over to that and I didn't get that response. And, and in this case, when you've got it with the endoscope, what you can do, another tip is you don't, you can't, you don't, the cyst could be quite big with still a lot of gelat gelatinous material within it. All you do is take the entire scope out. Don't try and take the scope out, leave the portal and introducer there. Take the whole thing out, it will come out with you if it's a big cyst. And I certainly had pictures of one big one, uh, this one, uh, uh, like that. And that was a natural thing to do at the time, suddenly between us two, we're doing it in theatre. So um, it's perfectly doable through the endoscope. Uh, this is a different story. Um, this is a 26 year old uh, with headaches. I'm going to jump ahead. I'm not going to discuss this very much, but this one came to surgery as well because we're toing and froing with symptoms. So it doesn't have to be huge, but if they can justify it because of symptoms and the age, then that's fine. I'm gonna switch over to try and just show you uh, a little bit of videos. Um, and uh, anytime you want me to stop, um, just, just let me know, but I'll, I'll try and I'll start off with this video. Um, can you see Rafid? No? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the video? No, not yet. You're uh, still not yet. I'm sorry. 
Okay. And there we go. Yep. How about now? Yeah, it's good. Oh my God, I'm showing my age now. This is from 2012, eight years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so this patient, I remember quite well now. This patient had had symptoms for, for months and for several weeks, but being increasing headaches. And for days, would, she'd even gone to A&E acutely and um, not had a scan because she would perk up. And then she rapidly deteriorated. And I remember uh, her husband had brought her um, in a car to A&E, almost unconscious, and it got fed up and, and she was in a bad way at that time. And um, she had, um, so she presented acutely and an EVD was put in on one side, which was sufficient, fortunately for her. And, these are, and this is a 20 minute video for the whole thing, unedited. Uh, obviously we don't have time to show you all of it unedited. Uh, video 20 minutes but uh, it is what it is and this just shows you how you do um, a septostomy people used to use like scissors don't use scissors you don't need to just stick the bipolar endoscope in and draw like a pencil and you can get a hole there uh, and that's that and you can put the endoscope in inspect the other side now we turn our attention um to um uh, so i'm also from a technical perspective you just keep bipolar in and, and then yeah, you yeah just put your you know, pick a spot where there's not many blood vessels on the septum, put your foot on the bipolar pedal, and you should control it, not the assistant, and just kind of move your endoscope like you're drawing, you know, um, and, and make sure you feel and touch the septum. And it just, it just cuts through it. That's absolutely fine. Um, so now we're going to look at the, uh, this is the cyst. And so the next thing is um, I chose here not to uh, coagulate the choroid plexus um, because I was just anxious to just get the, the cyst done. I think I just went for this pretty quickly. Uh, no, there you go, sorry, yeah, I, I did coagulate, it did start to collect a bit. Um, and then, um, bear with me, I'm gonna jump ahead a bit uh, after some coagulation. So then um, you see hopefully the gelatinous stuff as I perforate the cyst, and you can do it with scissors, grabbers, or with a bipolar. Um, and then you'll see the gelatinous material start to come out. Um, and when I see that yellowy gelatinous stuff, um, which you see the vast majority of the time, I, I breathe a sigh of relief because um, it's really reassuring knowing that um, you, can, you, can, you can deflate this. Can you see that stuff? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now, yes. what you can do now at this point is get ready to do suction. That's what I'm doing here. Can you see it? Can you see the jet kind of coming out? It's coming out because you've got the suction at the end of the lotter scope or a lotter like scope. Uh, and then you switch over from heavy irrigation to suction. Can you see that stream of gelatin? Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then it's a huge amount is already deflated. And then as it gets more and more, you put the scope there, get it really close to it irrigate heavily, suction, irrigate heavily, suction until more and more of this material comes out. And then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit by two minutes. Um, so this is, uh, you'll see now more of it. Can you see the, the kind of blob of gelatin? Um, but you can use the grabber to grab some of it, but then you start to see the capsule as you've deflated it. The capsule, I think, is easy to resect. The first time I saw it, I think it was Graham actually showed me, and then, and then I did joint cases with Peter, um, because it was a large volume center, and we would get a few every year, and they would all come, they would call, you know, one of us. Um, and see the capsule of the cyst here? So you can, you can just grab, you can, you can grab it gently and then twist. I'm just trying to find a point where I've done this, and it will just come away with you. Um, but gently, just keep heavy irrigation and gently. I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit to see where I can find it. Sorry, that was it. But I, uh... Anyway, this is now the scope is in the third ventricle. I'm sorry I've jumped ahead. This is the blob of that material. I was just trying to get this last bit out, um, which you eventually did with suction. Um, and I'm going to find you the view of the inside the third ventricle, um, which is quite beautiful, I think. So let's see if we can go. Am I going back into the into the frame of Monroe? Yeah. Bear with me. 
because when you go to the front Monroe, you see a lovely anatomy, which you see, you know, with other endoscopic stuff. Can you see the aqueduct there on your left at the bottom? Um, and if I go a little bit deeper, um, you can see the posterior commissure, um, which is just uh, above and posterior to the aqueduct. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see it a bit better in the next video. Can I show you another one, if I may? Um, sure. Because I think this is useful for the trainees and any other consultants who want to, who haven't got the Kuzer. Um, and I've got more to show you, but this is another one. This is from 2013. Oh, yeah. Can you see this one? Yes, no? Oh, yeah. ah. oh right. My apologies. Um, how about now? Yeah. Good. Okay. So this is a cyst that was causing hydrocephalus intermittently, patient not of symptoms, definitely hydrocephalic, but not clearly blocking, uh, you know, the ventricle, but it was, you know, we decided to do it and it was, it was symptomatic on and off and was fed up and we were worried that he's going to block sometime. So I'm putting an endoscope in, you can see, you just missed a good view. Let me just freeze it here as I put the endoscope in. And this is again unedited. This was only a seven minute video. That's how long it took. Can you see this view here? Can you see my pointer? Yes. Great. Mammillary bodies, floor to third ventricle. This here is the infundibular recess. Okay, imagine like a dip, big dip inwards. Above that would be the optic, and above that higher would be the optic recess, and above that is the anterior commissure, more anteriorly. Okay, so now if I look backwards, I will see the aqueduct. It's here. Can you see that? Here. Yes. Now, you might say, how come you're able to get such a good view of the aqueduct? Well, because the trajectory of the scope is slightly more anterior. So it's as if you're going to do almost, almost like a pineal biopsy. So your trajectory with your scope, you've got to be mindful. Here, I came more anteriorly on purpose because that uh, colloid cyst is more posterior in the third ventricle and I want to get right into access to access it by looking backwards at it. It was dangling at the top of the third ventricle at the top, like a sort of um, a, a little plum. And, I, and I, so the trajectory I've got is on purpose more anterior. And that's the aqueduct. I can see the video of the posterior commissure. Can you see that there? That's the posterior commissure. And I still can't see the colloid cyst, but I can see a bit of it here. Okay, there. Can you see it? Here. Now, we're going to go ahead until I find, this is a nice aspiration, and I really had to aspirate it heavily uh, and left a lot of it behind, but I was happy enough with it. So I've made a hole in it here. Okay, can you see that gelatinous stuff coming out? Yes. Just a bit in a minute. Uh, um, sorry, yeah, with a, with a grabber. Can you see that? Yes. Now, this looks more uh, tough and less liquid, but I'm putting a bit of suction, having a, having a check, and it's one hand with a lotter, with a lotter scope, uh, or a lotter type one, the old lotter. Um, but you can do it with an Oi Handy Pro um, as well, or, or anyone. Now, you put heavy suction on the, you put a suction tube on the exit port of the scope, and it irrigate heavily and, and on and off, like two seconds at a time. And this one came out beautiful um, in the sense that you get it like almost like lava. Just watch this, okay? okay. Can you see? It, it looks like a lava stream coming up the scope. And I was, uh, you know, taking a bit of a chance with this, but I wasn't getting, let it go into the ventricle itself. It's all coming up the scope. It's so much suction that even the irrigation ran out and it's a sort of almost empty ventricle. So I pour in the irrigation to irrigate heavily acutely so that the brain is not sagging. And now it's filled up again. And you see that even in the refractive index of the scope, it looked odd because some of it is fluid and some of it is not. And then soon it's full up with fluid again. And there you go, okay? And that's how you aspirate a colloid cyst. Um, and then I can now look into the ventricle and I've got a solid view of the aqueduct. I know that's not gonna cause much problem. This is highly unlikely to fill up and cause this patient symptoms. And I'm, I chose to accept this because I tried to excise it uh, and some of it did come, but the entire capsule didn't. And I'm gonna jump ahead. And I, I chose to back out and not remove every bit of it. And that is fine. You don't need to, you can leave a little bit of cholestis behind depending on the age and stage. 
because um, the, the patient is highly unlikely in the course of their lifetime to, to uh, particularly at this age, to, um, to have a problem with that. Okay, this is a nice view. Can you see that? Aqueduct, posterior commissure, uh, and uh, you know, clear view of the ventricle, of the, of the third ventricle. And that, you know, you know, if you put your scope more anteriorly, that's how you can get on and do an aqueductoplasty if you rarely ever need to do one or do anything in that region. Um, um, Rafi, is there any questions from anybody at the moment uh, that maybe I could help with? Hold on, yeah. Don't be uh, afraid. Uh, yeah, one question we have from, oh, hold on, it's because you're moving the screen. It's missing again, just one second. Sorry, I'm saying stop sharing. Yeah. So one question we have from Stuart Portilla is, could we use an MRI to make, to help with the trajectory and, and the endoscope more posterior? And, and yeah, when I use the endoscopes in the ventricle, I am a heavy user of EM guiders personally. Do you think that's helpful with these, um, more sort of in these cases? I guess you depend on, on anatomy, which you see and you follow veins, et cetera. But any, any comments you have on that, on the use of, of um, additional imaging to help yeah, that? Absolutely. Um, so I think if you've got the facilities and, and you feel you will benefit from it, use it. So if you want to use neural navigation to know where you are, um, when you first, for example, get into lateral ventricle, okay, that's fine. You shouldn't need it in a hydrocephalic case. And if you're familiar with anatomy, you shouldn't need it. But if you want to use it, that's fine. It's a bit like um, if you're clipping an unruptured middle several artery aneurysm, okay? Um, you know, if you're not doing three or four in a day, like yours days, um, and you've got, you know, one case to do, um, plus something else, well, use neural navigation because on a CTA, you can, you know exactly where to open the fissure and be right on top of the aneurysm or just behind, or just in front of it to put your, uh, occlusion, you know, temporary click on the M1. So use these tools. Absolutely fine. Use them. Um, uh, so yeah, there's no problem with using neural navigation, uh, in a timely fashion. So in this particular case, if you really want to make your precise incision, your opening in the lateral ventricle and your point of trajectory for access to the, to the cyst, it's very reasonable to use it. No problem at all. And then another question we have about access and approach, I guess, is um, where, where would you place your burr holes? And I think, uh, although it's not really described here, but I think, can you tell us both your burr hole for your um, endo endoscopic uh, approach and also um, I mean, the question is, I think, regarding that, because it's asking regarding relative to the midline and coronal suture. But you might as well say, if you can, also where you place your burrholes when you do um, yeah. 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 as well, as I know. A, no, a, for the, so uh, once again, before I tell you where the burrholes, I think it's good to get really good at one of these approaches. If you're trying to do endoscopic and transclosal and transventricular for a problem that is relatively rare, okay, I don't know anyone who's really good at all three. It just, it just isn't. So if you're going to use transcolosal, um, the, the picture was there. I mean, basically, you go where the corona suture is and go slightly anterior to it. And I think if you go one third behind the corona suture with your first bar hole, and if you want to put three bar holes, fine on the sinus, uh, and, and put two thirds of your incision anterior to the, to the corona suture, just like you do in a pericolosal, um, and that's fine. For, the, for a, where you put your hole, or uh, a transventricular route or an endoscopic route, very similar to where you put your hole for an EVD, but in a trajectory so that you're slightly more anterior um, than, than normal. So if you go, let's say, a centimeter or two centimeters even uh, anterior to the coronal suture for endoscopic, that's fine. I wouldn't go any more anterior than that. The reason is your endoscope, because remember, you're not trying to do an ETV. You're not trying to get access really to the lateral, to the third floor, the third ventricle to make a hole there. You don't need to do that. Um, and if you go um, too anterior, you, you might damage the fornix. So you want to go anterior enough to have good access to the top and the back of the third ventricle. Um, but I think a, you know, an EVD kind of site insertion for your bar hole is fine. You don't need to worry about it any, any more than that. But be prepared in your setup to convert to a transventricular route if it's not possible to do it endoscopically. Um, and I know the people who do large numbers of endoscopic, there's always a you know, few around the world, they'll say, no, every one of them I can do endoscopic. And I can start to believe it. But I think for us mere mortals, if you've done, I've only done, I think, now 11 endoscopic and about another, um, what, 26, so 
15 open uh, that I was involved in. And if I get another one, I will just do endoscopic because I find it so easy because of the other endoscopic CSF stuff that I do. So if you've done hundreds of endoscopic CSF procedures, hundreds, you will find it much more straightforward. Okay. Um, I mean, and re regarding that, the approach, we had a question from Rahul who's asking, um, how do you decide? I mean, you've already mentioned and answered, but how do you decide um, the difference between whether you go for micro surgical or endoscopic excision? I don't know if the, everybody's hearing that, but that's the applause for the NHS. <laughs> you can <hear> it. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. We should be clapping. Look at you got a clap at the NHS from John all the way in Florida. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the NHS, I know it's a big agency, that's all. Okay, there's, a, there's a lot of people doing a lot of hard work in, in the NHS, and um, God bless them all. I can hear the whistling even from here. Oh, there's all the, all the hooting here. We can op if I open the door, you'll definitely hear it. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I think yeah. what question is how, what would. Um, how would you decide? Or let's say somebody is trained up on both of them or decide in between them. Is there anything in a certain case with, which you would think is that's a good one to go, you know, go microsurgical or go endoscopic? Um, your, your experience and your skill set, as I said, for me is now endoscopic because of the endoscopic stuff I've done. Um, also consistency of a, um, you know, hyper intensity on T2 and on T1 that it's uniform, that it looks soft and gelatinous, uh, even more stronger case. If you see something, um, you know, uh, you suspect a thick capsule and it's quite hard uh, or calcification within it, then um, you're probably better off not to do it that way. But even then, I would say I would try endoscopic. The reason is you put your endoscope in, you can do a septostomy and do a shunt if you want to and leave it. Okay, because that's a perfect way to manage it. Absolutely fine. You can try endoscopic excision. And if it's not going well, you can convert to transventricular route. So for me, endoscopic is is the key chance, regardless because of so many because of its advantage the problem with the endoscopic route obviously is the greater risk of seizures and you're going through brain so you know some who hate doing that and i can understand that will say it's much better going through a corpus callosum of one centimeter incision and if you see the videos of johan i've got some of them they're absolutely beautiful so if you're as good as that uh, or close to that and uh, transcalosal get on with it that's fine um, so, it, but anyway, those are my tips for that. Well, then there's a question about complications. I don't know if you're going to come on to that or, or no more. Sorry. Sure. Um, so complication. They're asking basically, if I can clarify, they're asking about what the complications that you've come across in. And there's also a question about um, somebody suggesting that they've had a venous infarct. Um, I guess your opinion on that. And also um, another question asking about is there a risk of aseptic meningitis when you aspirate the contents of the cyst? Okay, so the common complication, let's face it, you're talking about um, um, hydrocephalus, which is persistent. So in endos endoscopic case, I've always left the drain in, an EVD drain. And you might say, well, why are you doing that if the cyst is gone and you're not encouraging normal flow? But if you've got a bit of debris, if you want to make sure wash out and you want to make sure the patient's waking up well and everything's well, leave a drain in and then clamp it in, in 24 hours and then do a scan. And if all is well, then you can get rid of it in 48, 72 hours. So it's good to leave a drain in wide bore. So it's draining well and, and not blocked by debris. Uh, that's one. So second problem is uh, obviously residue. And, and uh, you know, that can happen acutely, which is very rare, or later down the line, a, a recurrence um, years later. Well, you have to deal with it uh, as you see fit, but it's very, very difficult. I've not, to be frank, I've never had an acute crisis after microsurgical excision or endoscopic because you, you clear the way, you get rid of the cyst and that's it. And if you leave a little bit behind of the capsule, um, then you accept you know, a little bit left behind and adhere and leave it. That's absolutely fine. Infection is a problem. Seizures can be a problem. Um, and, and, you know, the, the devastating stuff is if you've done a transcalosal and you've uh, got a venous infarct on your way in or you've got a major arterial injury god forbid well you know you're not going to change that just just don't don't get it uh, but those those are uh, those are sad and of course damage to the fornix which shouldn't happen i think it, it just shouldn't happen um, um but if you do you know that that's one of the recognized sad um, that can be a disaster i mean i remember seeing a patient um as a as a red shrub uh, of somebody who had left the hospital I was working at who had phonocele injury and it's an absolute disaster. I um, mean, the memory um, is basically, I, can, I couldn't think of something so 
so cruel for a quality of life perspective. That, that was a very sad case of somebody who couldn't, I think, um, yeah, long-term memory she, can, she, she had, but all short-term memory was gone. It's almost something that you see in a movie or something. It was, it's a very shocking complication. So I would agree with you on that, on the yeah. importance of the policies. Yeah. Um, any, any other questions? Because it could be massive. I, is it, uh, I think someone's asking any shunt dependency. I've, uh, for endoscopic or, or microsurgical, I've not had to, I don't recall putting a shunt in afterwards. Um, I think if you get an excision, then that, that's the end of it. Um, I've known case that, uh, you, know, you, you know, debris can block things off and I've seen that more than once. Um, but um, no, shunt dependency, it, it shouldn't be the case. And I, and I think shunt operation, particularly for the elderly, or if you don't want to excise it, provided the ventricles communicate, is absolutely fine. Um, and if, you, if they don't communicate, you can use neural navigation to put your catheter across both sides. Um, any other thing? I think someone's asking about absence of angiography. I'm, I'm, maybe I miss. I, well, they I, could, the question I think is, um, also if, if you, they don't have, if you don't have a dominant vein, yeah, um, or you can't, um, you can't um, find that out. Hmm. What would you use then? Which side? I assume it's the right side, or uh, is there anything else yeah. that you? Um, I would use the right side simply because it's in the vast majority of the population is a non-dominant hemisphere. Um, can I mention that so angiography is not necessary to do that. You just do a detailed CTA, fine cut CTA. So if you do a fine cut CTA, you'll be able to see um, uh, your, uh, you know, which, which phenomenon Monroe has got the dominant venous system. Don't read too much into it. I don't go heavily by it, but if you, it's something that I do look at. And certainly if you're going to do a rare operation, which is rare, which is going through the lateral ventricle into the third ventricle for a tumor, then you should. I think it's a very good tip that Hugo Toure uh, gave in a talk, which was very supported by, by Yasuke. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a good tip. Another question is, Mosul, do you ever use um, seizure prophylaxis for endoscopic cases? No. no. Okay, well, if someone's had a seizure, I give it. Old school in the United Kingdom, particularly when I, when I trained the old school surgeons, anybody with any supratentorial pathology when they had surgery is to give phenytoin. I think we've gone beyond that. Now, if you, if you do, for example, an ACOM aneurysm and you suck a little bit of gyrus rectus or do any surgery around that area, which is epileptogenic, then you can give it. If you're doing something which is very epileptogenic, you give it. Um, or if someone's obviously had a seizure, you give it. But if they haven't, then I don't give it. Um, but it can be variable and you know, some people want to do that, that's fine. I don't see any reason. And I think the literature is pretty strong on this now because and anticonvulsants have a side effect. And if you give it, then it's about when to stop it and so on. Um, but I don't see any reason to. Okay. If someone's got acute hydrocephalus and, and, and you, you're irritating the brain and you're doing it in an acute setting, to give it for one week is also very reasonable. I generally don't do it unless someone's had a seizure. No, you really strongly suspect one, which is not likely to be the case. There's a couple of technical questions. Is um, One is, if you have bleeding, what, what do you do? And another is, if the foramen of Monroe is too small, what do you do? And do you cut the fornix? So, what's your, what, what <laughs> yeah. those no, two? Good question. So if you get bleeding, this is a very good question. Uh, don't panic. Keep your endoscope still, know where you are, and don't just keep moving around because you won't see anything and it's full of blood. And then, you know, you might go into somewhere you don't want to do. Just irrigate, irrigate heavily. Make sure the port of the endoscope is open, God forbid, so that you, you're getting a, what you're putting in, you're getting out. Um, I don't use irrigation bags with pressure bags around them. Never use them because they, they can be dangerous uh, under anesthesia like it. You just get someone to say, just say, squeeze the bag if you want to increase your irrigation or raise the height of the bag. Um, I'm sorry that my appearance on this thing is becoming like a ghost. Can I just put some light in here? Then maybe. Yeah, you can change oh. the background. Yeah. Yeah. Hold or on. just take the background off completely. Okay. Okay. Bear with me. Might be there. The light. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Abe. You have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, so Hello. basically, if you get hemorrhage, you, you irrigate and just irrigate using Hartman's. It always, always stops from my experience. And it's a dangerous thing to say in medicine, to say always, but it does stop. And there was a famous neurosurgeon from long ago said, all bleeding always stops. I mean, that's true. But, you know, if you, it, it, it will stop. And um, I've had 
uh, that experience with other surgeries and, and tumors and other stuff that we've done. And uh, it's because that's how I was taught. And, and, and it's true, particularly bleeding after a colloid cyst, you will get this kind of, you know, it does go red, particularly if you, when you, when you've got a, a decent um, capsular supply, but you just irrigate and it just slows down and then it stops and it's, it's clear. Okay, well, I think that's clear. Let's see if there's any other questions. I don't think, I think there is. No way. I think someone, yeah, uh, a, the, uh, Benali, eight, Benali has a question. You raise your hand. Go ahead, eight. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for this uh, very nice uh, lecture. Uh, Not a professor, I a, you're welcome. <laughs> I have a question about posterior location of colloid cyst attached to the roof of V3. Hmm. Is the, uh, on the flexible endoscope useful in this situation? Um, I don't know. I've not used the flexible endoscope in that situation. Um, and although I've used the flexible endoscope years ago, um, I, the problem with the flexible endoscope that I remember it was that the view that you get through the flexible endoscope is not very good because the lighting system and the camera is just not as good as a, as a straight scope. Um, so, and I know people talk about the flexible endoscope uh, very fondly, particularly for doing aqueductal procedures and anything into the fourth ventricle, even sucking out blood and, and doing evacuations. Um, I think it's about what skill set you have and how comfortable you are to use it. I don't have experience with that. Um, as I you always use the rigid scope, um, but the benefit of the rigid scope is that you can change it to a 30 degree scope and see better, or even a 70 degree one to look further back uh, or in front. Um, but I don't know about the flexible one. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, there's more questions in the, in the uh, chat if you want to ask them, but he if you yeah. Look, yeah, look them over and see which ones are important to you. Well, I think actually we've I think we've covered all of them. I, I okay. summarized some of them all in one. Um, okay. There's actually anything else. Um, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of compliments for a very clear teaching session, and I I thought it was as well. So yeah, good. very interactive. You guys did great. Lots of good videos. No, um, I mean we can we can show more, um, but I think probably everyone's a bit. <laughs> Well, it's good teaching. I think it's great teaching. Maybe if, I was a, if I was a neurosurgeon, I'd want to get more. Maybe, maybe we'll do another session on it, and I'll show you um, some more videos, um, endoscopic uh, and okay. open. That's um, fine. Yeah, I think it's good not to overload as well. I agree with Mosul. I think they were good tips. It's a good sort of how, how you do it. And I think that's a good starting point. Um, okay. And, I, and, I, and as I mentioned in the beginning briefly, I think we'll, we'll be doing regular ones. And, and on Saturday, Mosul, you'll be... Kiari, doing Kiari, is that right? Yeah, I think there's some really, I'm passionate about Kiari. I know it may have been a bit, and I'd love to have a, a nice session with um, with Atoll. Atoll I, think, I think he'll come on, he'll, he'll do yeah. it. Well, we had a good set. He was our guest in Birmingham for the Kiari uh, meeting, and Graham uh, Flint and Marcus Studley and Andy Broadbelt and, um, and uh, Paolo Bolognese were all there, and I think they'd be fantastic people to have here for this discussion. Well, we talk to them every day. Yeah, well, it'd be an honor. Um, yeah, great. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. No problem. So yeah, we'll be aiming at 7 p.m. on Saturday. And as I mentioned, I've, I've formed the WhatsApp group. So hopefully we'll be able to that's, send That's it. a good move. I saw another group that really got a lot of traction with their video from the WhatsApp. They got a lot of the speakers from the WhatsApp group. Well, for me, I'm just going to update the flyer that you yeah. send so that people okay. know what we're doing. But 7 p.m., Mosul will be given that. Um, just, they're asking how they can join. So just send me your number with the country code and I'll add you um, to the group so that I can just send you the updates on when we're doing these talks. So it'll be under the banner of Global Neurosurgery Grand Rounds. And we're aiming to do between two and three a week um, okay. until we get back great. to normal. Work. Great, I'll copy <laughs> this file and, and give you the numbers. Yeah. Okay, John, great. John and Rafid, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I just say to, to everyone, if you've gotten questions and nuances about the Chiari stuff or anything complex CSF, I'd love to hear more from you. And, and um, also, there's a WhatsApp group now. They can, they're going to message you direct. <laughs> so prepare your questions. There's lots to discuss. And we'll do two sessions on Chiari. One about diagnosis and management specifically, which is broad, uh, rather than diagnosis and management of investigations. And the other separate one on operations and nuances for surgery. Excuse me, I have a question if you don't mind, uh, Go ahead. sir. Thank you very much for your uh, great uh, presentation. I'm Dr. Jaran Najjar from Syria. 
Uh, I want to ask you, I sent my question twice, uh, but I do not have any answer. How many cases you have it in endoscopic way and how many cases you choose uh, transcalosal uh, approach for? I've counted 26 in my series, which is not a lot, uh, but it's mm -hmm. more than vast majority because you know you, they're not common operations. And the last 11, all endoscopic. I haven't done one for some time because you've got to get the, the, the cases. Um, now that I've done endoscopic, because of how I was persuaded, because of, as I mentioned, two great names to you, I mean, Graham Flint and, and Peter Gann, when I was in Birmingham, I've switched over to endoscopic and I wouldn't hesitate endoscopic because I do other stuff endoscopically. I'm very comfortable with it. Um, and I think it really the, the point I would make about choice of surgery is very much, you know, to do with your own preference and expertise. So if you get really good at one way, let's say transcalosal, then do that, but be really good at it. And if you're yes. going to get uh, endoscopic, do that, fine, because they both have clear merits and advantages. You know, mm -hmm. at transcalosal, you don't go through cortex. Let's face it, chance of seizures and epilepsy is much less. And it's a lovely, beautiful, elegant operation. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, if you were the endoscopic, they're sitting up talking to you in recovery. Okay, mm -hmm. very rapid, yeah. very quickly, with, even with it following acute hydrocephalus. So um, that was the big attraction that I can make a bar hole, do what I need to do, and then get out and, and, and have a good result. Uh, and and uh, so, yeah. That's what I want uh, to tell you. I have be, been uh, working with endoscopy since 1995. And One I have, it's, yes, it's uh, very rare uh, cases for colloid cysts, but I have endoscopic cases, about uh, 32 cases. Wonderful. Uh, it is published with Professor Osama and Mifti in his uh, famous book, Controversy on Neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. So my, I, I, I did the chapter for the endoscopy and he did the chapter for transcalosal. Mm -hmm. Actually, now, uh, now, now uh, the, the, the total excision and total cure become more, um, more ac uh, acceptable by endoscopy when you take it all with the capsule. Uh, this made the recurrence is very, very low, and this may, makes the complication also very low. As you told, after, uh, to, to, told us, after one or two days, the patient will be out of uh, the, 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 in, in, in the ward, in the hospital, without ICU, without any complication with the uh, bridging veins and uh, injuries to the uh, veins or the cortex. or the, And the most important thing is that whenever you did the colloid cyst with the endoscope, uh, uh, all the people attack you that, that you will not see the, uh, the, the, the point of the uh, origin of the colloid cyst in the roof of the third ventricle. And this is uh, true, but this is on all approaches, you cannot see it because you do, you, you, you enter it from Monroe, the same approach. So still the endoscopic is minimal invasive and more safe. Dr. Najjar, um, um, it's an honor. I'm, everything you say, I agree with, but I think Thank we can also... Um, assess why these patterns keep happening in neurosurgery and, and other things. And, and one of them is, you know, people get stuck to their own ways and people think that maybe perhaps their opinion is, is, is what matters more. And it's a bit like um, persuading someone to do endoscopic pituitary surgery when they've been doing it open microsurgically for years. But you've got to respect people, we all do, that if they're really happy yeah. doing that and they get good results, carry on. Yes. But there's no doubt in the passage of time that developing a new skill set with better technology and traveling and seeing and watching each other's videos and sharing experiences can be very persuasive. And then you realize something, a greater truth that, hey, maybe I am not as great doing this, but someone else is. And, I, and you respect their approach because they're clearly getting good results and you can see the videos and you can see the patients are doing well. But at the end of the day, in our hospitals and in our settings, when patients come to us, we've got to offer the best we can. Uh, but to keep an open mind to say, constantly things change. For example, something that you, you may be aware of more is that you've got different types of scopes, obviously. You've got ones with wide bore, the Vibron Esculap one, which has got different access ports, and you can do a lot more surgery with that. Now, that has got a much wider bore to put in, for this kind of surgery, and you can do a lot more with it. You can bipolar, diathermy, cut, and all these things at the same time. Do you need to use such a big scope for this? There'd be a bit controversy. I would say you don't. I can just put a small lotoscope in or an oil handy pro get the same result from a small hole in the brain. You know, so there is a lot more nuances about about it all. But I think it's respecting opinion and going by evidence and good science. Um, 
and knowing that, you know, um, there's a lot of opinions out there, different skill sets and new technology, and to be um, and to be respectful of uh, of other people's results uh, and learn from them. Yeah, yes, I I'm agree. Uh, I'm agree for, uh, with you, but but nobody can uh, can speak about the transcalosal. It's very safe as uh, Ernest Nemi, you have Ernest Nemi, who did uh, uh, the the the, the uh, basilar aneurysm within uh, 45 hours, uh, 45 uh, minutes, and he's very uh, famous in this. So uh, should be uh, uh, considered for all the, not in special hands, not in my hands, in other hands. This should be considered. Uh, uh, I, I agree, and, and I worked with Johan. It was an honor, and um, you know, to watch him and assist with him do you know MC aneurysms in in fifteen minutes and basilars yeah. under thirty minutes, yes, and yes. and some complex stuff uh, was was wonderful. And you learn so many tips. And it's not about speed. Um, in fact, there's one thing that surgeons shouldn't do and believe in, and that's the word hurry. But, but he was comfortable. He had done so much. The principles were so fluent that he just went at a lovely pace. And um, I, for example, remember the thing that shook me was I kept thinking, how are you going to just get this colosis out with a scope when I saw Graham do it first? And when he was kind of pulling and tugging and rotating, and then when it came, and then there was this surge of blood, and he took it out and just carried on irrigating, and then I saw it all clear up, I was like, wow. So it's, it's different to what I expected. I was told you must take the supply and must make sure the capsule is cut and make sure there's no bleeding and so on and so forth. But when I saw it's a different field really in an intraventricular with PSF all around it and how easily the bleeding stops, particularly from very small capillaries and veins, um, then um, I was like, I was moved. Um, so yeah, it, it looks sometimes unelegant because you're not cutting something necessarily. You're just pulling and tugging, but it works. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, by the way, Yuha will probably be around next week. Oh, it's an honor. It'd be an honor. Yeah, to... yeah. You, you know we're going to have a popular panel that week. I would love to just listen in, even. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, if there's no more questions, should we call it a day? Sure. Yeah, sure. thanks very much, Monsal. I think that was great. Like <laughs> thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, everybody. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for um, we'll, the we'll opportunity. On Saturday, John. Okay, thank very you, good. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.